slavery. To this day, it remains one of the ugliest blots in the long journey of humanity. Slavery can be traced back as early as 4000 BC, as old as written history itself. From Mesopotamia to Egypt, from Greece to Rome, through the Middle Ages and into the African slave trade, the enslavement of one human being by another has wedged its cruel memory into the hearts and minds of human consciousness. Even today, the African slave trade remains etched in our souls as the ultimate degradation of mankind. The man who perhaps more than any other stirred the conscience of the world to see the horror and evil of slavery was William Wilberforce. His efforts helped bring liberty to untold millions. His persistence and conviction influenced major change in the thinking and the history of the world. William Wilberforce was born in 1759 in the bustling seaport of Kingston on Hull in England. His father was a prosperous merchant. The family lived comfortably in their high street mansion. The world into which Wilberforce was born had two faces. There was the elegant and affluent face of a world smugly aware that it was the age of enlightenment. But there was also the horrible face of cruelty, corruption, and extreme poverty. The luxury of the few on top was made possible by the multitudes below who could only eke out a meager existence. Cheap gin often provided welcome escape. Brutal sports were the most popular distraction. The slave trade, child labor, and the dehumanizing hardships of the emerging industrial revolution were expressions of a heartlessness that infected every level of society. Against this setting, Wilberforce came to Parliament representing Hall in 1780 when he was 21. He was the closest friend of the Prime Minister, William Pitt, but they were two quite different men. Pitt, three years ahead of Wilberforce at Cambridge University, had been a serious, conscientious student. He was tall and reserved. Wilberforce was cheerful, frivolous, a pleasure seeker, small and slight in stature. But he also was a man of great wit and charm that served him well as he enjoyed the dazzling life of 18th century London. Wilberforce, Pitt, and some of their friends were great frequenters of the clubs in St. James. Their favorite haunt was called Goose Trees. Here, a young man would make or lose a fortune at the gambling tables in a single night. Wilberforce was also a great orator in an age noted for its outstanding orators, and he had such a fine singing voice he was called the Nightingale of the House of Commons. So, not surprisingly, dashing young William was in great demand on the social scene. When the Prince of Wales heard him sing at the Duchess of Devonshire's ball, he declared that he would go anywhere to hear him. In 1783, Wilberforce became representative of the County of Yorkshire. That was the most important and coveted seat in the House of Commons. While he was campaigning one day, the great British writer James Boswell heard him give a rousing speech. Boswell later wrote, I saw what seemed a mere shrimp of a man mount on a table, but as I listened, he grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. The crowd shouted for this little man to be their representative, and he was elected. The victory placed him just below the top leaders. He was the closest ally of Pitt. A brilliant future seemed assured.
The next year, Wilberforce went to Europe with his former tutor, Isaac Milner. This trip would shake William Wilberforce to the core of his being. Milner was a brilliant man who grasped the heart of Christianity. They had plenty of time to talk and think, and Milner helped Wilberforce consider his life, his relationship with God, and the meaning of Christianity. As a result of this time together, Wilberforce experienced a profound and noticeable change in his thinking, his life, and his character. In the months that followed, Wilberforce rose early each morning to seek God's guidance and to record his meditations in a journal. He radically changed many of his habits. He gave up gambling when he won a huge amount from some players he knew could not afford the loss. He resigned from all the clubs he had previously enjoyed so much. He quit drinking the nights away and concentrated on building real friendships. Now he had to face what it would mean to his public image if he were seen to be an evangelical Christian, for they were mockingly called enthusiasts and were commonly attacked for their outspoken faith and spiritual vitality. One of the evangelicals was the Reverend John Newton. He formerly had worked the slave ships. In fact, at one time, he actually was made a servant to slaves in Africa. But he later advanced to become a captain of a slave ship. The great blasphemer, as he was once known, had become a devout Christian and is still remembered today as the author of perhaps the best known hymn in all history, Amazing Grace. Newton had become minister of a church in London. In Wilberforce's journal, there appears an entry repeated often that said, go and converse with Mr. Newton. After much inner struggle, Wilberforce finally went secretly to Newton's home. Their meeting was a turning point for the young politician. In his journal, Wilberforce stated, when I came away, my mind was in a calm and tranquil state. And from that point on, he no longer seemed to be afraid of what people would think of him for his deepening Christian convictions. However, Wilberforce was concerned about his relationship with the Prime Minister, William Pitt. After all, they were old friends, and Wilberforce was said to be the only one that Pitt really trusted. They loved to get away from the pressures of government, to relax and unwind together, at Wilberforce's home in Wimbledon. And Pitt counted heavily on Wilberforce's support in Parliament. But I cannot be such a political party man as before, Wilberforce wrote. Now he voted and spoke his own conscience. He searched intently to find what really was his calling in life. Through Newton and others, his attention turned more and more toward the slave trade. Since 1713, Britain was the leading slave trading nation of Europe. Slavery was one of her most profitable industries. Ships sailed from British ports to the west coast of Africa. There, they captured human cargoes or they simply bought them from traders. Some African chiefs were known to have sold the entire population of some of their own villages for brandy or gunpowder. 70,000 black men, women, and children were shipped every year to plantations in the West Indies and America. Below deck, they were chained on shelves with less than three feet of headroom. No one even knows how many thousands died because of the appalling conditions aboard ship.
Others died of suicide, broken hearts, or brutal treatment from the masters. Records show that in one 10-year period, ships from Liverpool, England alone carried more than 300,000 slaves that sold for millions of pounds. The slaves were auctioned off as if they were cattle. Healthy men sold for up to 40 pounds each. Sick and wounded men, women and children sold for less. At these auctions, families would be broken up, sold to different owners, sometimes never to see each other again for the rest of their lives. This profitable traffic in human flesh exploited white victims as well. Young men were seized in the streets and forced to serve as crew on slave ships. Others were lured into debt by gambling in taverns. For many, such drunken debts meant either going to prison or to work on the slave ships. Multitudes of poor people were kidnapped and sent to the plantations for seven to 10 years as so-called indentured servants. Their owners had no long-term use for them, so they often were treated as cruelly as the black slaves themselves. Owners of the slave plantations would return from the Americas and use their wealth to purchase not only large estates in England, but also seats in Parliament. They gathered into a powerful lobby to protect their profitable business. Slave trading brought considerable wealth to many areas of Britain. It was taken for granted that the commerce and prosperity of the country depended on it. But there were voices in the 18th century that began to speak out. Preacher John Wesley railed against the slave trade as the execrable sum of human villainy. Other respected figures, such as Samuel Johnson, publicly voiced opposition, but to no avail. Granville Sharp, a clerk in the government ordinance office, taught himself law, and for years he pleaded for the mistreated slaves in Britain. His compassion and persistence led to the first real breakthrough when the British courts granted freedom to slaves on British soil in 1772. But this applied only to Britain. It did nothing to help the masses of slaves toiling under brutal conditions across the seas, safely out of sight of the British people. Then, in 1783, an appalling event seized the attention of all of Britain. The slave ship Zaw, bursting with slaves packed between its decks, got lost on the way to the West Indies. 67 died on board from an epidemic. The captain of the ship threw 132 slaves, still alive, into the seas. This was on the pretext, the captain said, of saving the rest of the cargo so it would be the insurance company, not the slave owners, who had to pay. One of the survivors got to Granville Sharp with the story. The ensuing court hearing cleared the captain of all blame. The court ruled that it was as if horses had been thrown overboard. Slaves were not to be regarded as people. They were just another form of property. This incident began to unite the anti-slavery forces. A group of six Quakers formed an abolition committee. Granville Sharp and a few others joined with them, but they could not make their case without more solid evidence. They had to get first-hand proof of what was really happening, and that help would come from a young surgeon, James Ramsey. Years before Ramsey was serving on the British Navy frigate Arundel in the West Indies under Captain Charles Middleton. On November 21, 1759, they encountered a slave ship and found a plague was raging on board. The young surgeon offered to board the slave ship to provide help. He was shocked by the sights he saw. He never forgot the horrors of the slaves' conditions, and from that day on, he was implacably opposed to slavery. Later, Dr. Ramsey was ordained into the Christian ministry and lived for many years on the island of St. Christopher. There, he struggled to improve the conditions of the slaves. 
The plantation owners bitterly opposed him and gradually wore him down. Finally, he gave up and returned home to England. His old naval captain, Sir Charles Middleton, had now become an important man in the village of Teston in Kent. In 1781, he arranged for Ramsay to become rector of the church there, some 22 years after Ramsay had boarded the slave ship as a doctor. The Middletons were Ramsay's neighbors. He gave them his detailed first-hand knowledge of the slave trade. Lady Middleton was moved. She urged Ramsay to go public, but Ramsay was afraid and had good reason to be. But Lady Middleton persisted, and Ramsay finally gave in, publishing a pamphlet telling the whole sordid story. Ramsay's writings aroused a storm of opposition. On the one hand, the slave traders did not want a troublemaker meddling in their very profitable business. On the other hand, his pamphlet was so convincing, it fired up many, including Sir Charles Middleton himself. Ramsay and Middleton gathered a group to work for the abolition of slavery. In the group, not surprisingly, was Granville Sharp. Also, a capable young Cambridge University graduate, Thomas Clarkson, who became the first to devote all his time to the cause. Sir Charles became a member of the British Parliament, one of only two members who were known to be evangelical Christians. He needed to find someone in the house to spearhead the anti-slavery clause. It would take someone very special to get this through Parliament, and the job would not be easy. Who had the courage to risk ruining his political career? Who was independent enough to win support from various parties, yet strong enough to put the cause ahead of the interests of his own party? Who was important enough, socially, to be listened to by the greatest in the land? The choice was obvious. It had to be William Wilberforce. Sir Charles Middleton, now an admiral, wrote William urging him to spearhead the abolition movement in Parliament. It was a responsibility Wilberforce weighed carefully, and he visited the Middletons to talk about it. That other early advocate of abolition, Thomas Clarkson, also pressed the case. He visited Wilberforce several times in the old palace yard at Westminster to enlist his support. Finally, it all seemed to come together for Wilberforce one day while visiting Pitt at his country home. The Prime Minister, Pitt himself, suggested that Wilberforce introduce a motion in the House of Commons for the abolition of the slave trade. After the meeting, Wilberforce wrote in his journal, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners, morals, in this country. He began to feel that if the slave trade were destroyed, it would be a key to humanizing the entire spirit of the nation. Thomas Clarkson agreed to gather the facts and traveled to all the main slave trading ports. In Bristol, he ran into cruel opposition, and it was said that he was shunned in the streets like a mad dog. But he found a hearing in the taverns in London and Liverpool. The seamen, who often were treated as badly as the slaves themselves, flocked to hear him. Clarkson drew up diagrams of a slave ship to show how the slaves were packed onto shelves in horrifying conditions. From these plans, a model was made that Wilberforce used as a visual aid in his campaign. Another visual aid they employed was a porcelain cameo made by Josiah Wedgwood the potter, whose name still is well known today for fine china. Wedgwood too was a member of the abolition committee, and the cameo was spread far and wide on snuff boxes, hat pins, and brooches, along with its slogan, Am I not a man and a brother?
things began to move. In February 1788, Parliament set up a committee to investigate the slave trade. Wilberforce and Clarkson intensified their efforts to gather evidence. But it wasn't easy, because in all the ports, the sailors were usually afraid to talk about the terrible facts they knew. Nonetheless, momentum built. People streamed into Wilberforce's home at all hours of the day and night to strategize and confer. This type of campaign to sway a broad cross-section of public opinion was entirely new in English history. That year, the motion for the abolition of the slave trade was moved for the first time in the House of Commons. But it went down under overwhelming opposition from the establishment and from the West Indian plantation owners. A year later, in 1789, the motion was introduced again. Wilberforce gave an impassioned three-and-a-half-hour speech, but to no avail. The planters were successful in gaining a postponement. From then on, year after year, Wilberforce moved the motion. After one debate, the Jamaican agent in London wrote that Wilberforce is blessed with a very sufficient quantity of that enthusiastical spirit that is so far from yielding that it grows more vigorous with blows. Wilberforce joined his friend Henry Thornton at his home on Battersea Rise near the village of Clapham. This became their campaign headquarters. Now there were abolition groups in many towns. And in the House of Commons, even members of the opposing political party Men like Charles James Fox, Sheridan, and Edmund Burke joined with Wilberforce. At Clapham, Wilberforce drew together a remarkable group of friends who came from all walks of life and different political parties. Many of them were joined together by the same kind of life-changing experience of Christ that Wilberforce had found. They lived, worked, and planned together passionately believing that if people could change, then societies and institutions could change as well. But in 1789, events in France shook the world. Revolution there, followed by the war between Britain and France, caused a major setback in the abolition movement. Revolutionary groups forming in England made the ruling class more reactionary and fearful. Now, even the king himself was opposed to the abolitionist cause. So, in 1791, when the motion for abolition was again brought up in Parliament, in spite of a fine speech by Fox, it again lost, this time by a vote of 163 to 88. The following year, Henry Dundas, Secretary of the Navy, moved and carried a motion for the gradual abolition of the slave trade. Dundas was an easygoing, unprincipled man. However, during the war with Napoleon, he was the most powerful man in government next to Prime Minister Pitt. The motion by Dundas, of course, took all the teeth out of Wilberforce's uncompromising objective to totally abolish slavery. If it were to be done gradually, it might never be done at all. These were dark years for both England and Wilberforce. There were bad harvests, economic recession, and widespread hunger. Riots broke out across the land. The king was actually jeered and stoned on his way to open parliament. In the face of growing civil unrest, Pitt's government passed a repressive act of parliament banning all types of public meetings. This only stirred up further bitter opposition. The rising fury in the nation erupted at a huge demonstration in York. Wilberforce drove madly up the Great North Road to be there. After arriving, he gave a memorable speech. It was described as unexcelled. This took the heat out of the uprising and turned the tide. The revolutionary movement went into decline. Meanwhile, back in Parliament, year after year, the slavery motion was defeated. 
In 1796, Wilberforce's opponents sprang a vote unexpectedly when many of his supporters were away. Wilberforce hurried from dinner to hold the house with an eloquent speech while friends raced around to gather his allies. But again, the vote was lost. On another occasion, it was defeated by only four votes because some of his supporters had been given tickets to an opera opening at Covent Garden and they missed the vote. Everything seemed to be against him. But in May of 1797, he married Barbara Spooner of Warwickshire. His wife and later a growing family brought great joy to him in spite of the political struggle. Their home became known as a place of renewal and relaxation, while at the same time, a beehive of activity. In the turmoil of his life, it was his Christian faith that daily gave him security and strength. For Wilberforce, Christianity had to be applied thoroughly and practically in the home, in business, and in politics. Wilberforce was called by the French writer Madame de Stael the wittiest man in England, as well as the most religious. Troubled by a decadent church, in 1797 he wrote a book urging that Christianity be applied to all of life. The book was a quick bestseller, going through six editions in five months, and reportedly it was read by all the leading persons in the nation. Many people were changed by the book. As one biographer commented, the book took the reader on a journey to discover how Christianity could and should guide the politics, habits, and attitudes of a nation from the highest to the lowest. It came at a critical moment. That year, England stood alone against Napoleon and only bad weather in the English Channel held back a full-scale invasion by the French. Then there was mutiny in the Navy and a widespread sense of gloom and defeat across the nation. Yet Wilberforce pressed for his slavery bill every year. Pitt, losing hope in abolition as a practical possibility and weighted down by the struggle with France, withdrew his support. In 1805, Parliament again voted on the slavery bill, and again, with supporters absent, the bill was defeated, this time 77 to 70. Wilberforce lost sleep for nights afterward, his mind tormented with thoughts of the thousands more who would go into lifelong bondage. To make matters worse, Wilberforce faced a continuing problem with his health. Even during enforced periods of recuperation at Bath, his life proved hectic and full of interruptions. Also in 1805, a scandal broke that further complicated matters. Remember Henry Dundas? He was exposed for being party to embezzlement of Navy funds. Wilberforce was with Pitt when the news arrived. It was a grievous blow to the Prime Minister. A motion of censure was to be moved in the House against Dundas. If it passed, he would be disgraced and ruined but as First Lord of the Admiralty, he was considered the most indispensable member of Pitt's government in the war against Napoleon. It was clear that in the Commons debate, Wilberforce's speech would be decisive. He knew that the impeachment of Dundas might destroy his friend Pitt as well. Yet, he was convinced that the fight against corruption had to begin somewhere. In the House, after great conflict, he threw in his weight for the censure motion. Pitt sat with tears streaming down his face. A biographer commented, by this single speech, Wilberforce may have altered the destiny of Britain. Strangely, the man appointed to replace Dundas was none other than Admiral Sir Charles Middleton, now 80 years old. He supervised every step in the sea campaign that culminated in the victory at Trafalgar. Even at his advanced age, Middleton proved a brilliant strategist, adept at human relations, 
and remarkably able to respond rapidly to changing conditions. Wilberforce wrote that he was deeply thankful to know that there was one efficient statesman who fervently prayed for every measure he engaged in and committed the event to the divine superintendence. The Dundas Affair, followed by the loss of Britain's allies in Europe, then the defeat at the Battle of Austerlitz, broke the spirit and health of Prime Minister William Pitt. He died in 1806. In the funeral procession, Wilberforce walked beneath Pitt's great banner, preceding the coffin. The new administration supported abolition. Thomas Clarkson, now back in action after broken health, toured the country and found new wide support among the young of the land. Wilberforce's old friend, Lord Grenville, was now Prime Minister. In the House of Lords, he and the young Duke of Gloucester, William Frederick, were the strongest allies for Wilberforce. While convalescing from sickness, he wrote a detailed book of evidence on the trade in preparation for what would be the crucial battle. The scene was extraordinary. The House of Commons, the date, February 23, 1807. Supporters of the slave trade were given their say, but now others were clamoring for the opportunity to speak in support of abolition. Finally, an eloquent speech was given in tribute to Wilberforce himself. This brought the house to its feet. The motion passed by a solid 283 to 16. William Wilberforce's battle had taken 20 years. Now came the enormous job of enforcing the new laws and policing the high seas. And there was the equally difficult task of getting other Western nations to take the same steps. Wilberforce wanted even more. Beyond stopping the slave trade, he also wanted to end slavery itself in all of the British possessions. Over the years, Wilberforce and his friends also pursued the second great aim he had set for his life, to change the callous and corrupt way of life in the country. The faith of the Clapamites, as they were called, gave them a compassion and concern not for just one cause, but for all people. They fought child labor and promoted education for the masses. They championed prison reform with approaches that were at least two generations ahead of their time. They introduced or supported every bill in Parliament to improve conditions in the factories. Wilberforce was a key player in these efforts and became known as the conscience of the nation. None of the radical humanitarians of the day were as purposeful, relentless, or determined as Wilberforce in alleviating poverty and suffering. It took another 26 years to get rid of slavery itself. On a July night in 1833, while Wilberforce was on his sickbed, news was rushed to him about the Emancipation Act. His decades-long vision and dream would soon be fulfilled, and he died three days later. The next year, 800,000 slaves throughout the British Empire were set free. Wilberforce and his Clapham comrades achieved much to change the social scene in England, but the ending of slavery was perhaps the most noteworthy. The historian G.M. Trevelyan described it as one of the turning points in the history of the world. 